Whenever we make a morphological rule, we are assuming there's some sort of underlying representation for the morphemes, be they roots or affixes. We are assuming that there's an underlying representation, which is the input of a rule. Then the rule performs some sort of transformation, and then poof, the rule spits out a surface representation. So some transformed version of the input so that it's the correct output. For example, in English, we have the plural, which we assumed had the underlying representation Z. Then this is transformed if it's in contact with a voiceless stop, for example, as in cats. And then boom, the Z is transformed into an S, cats. So again, we are assuming that there's some sort of underlying representation for these objects. However, we, we haven't been uh, paying a lot of attention to how we choose an underlying form. So far, we have been choosing them uh, if, for example, they are the, the one with the most varied environments or the one that we see most often. In this video, we're going to pay more attention to how we choose an underlying representation. And we're going to see how choosing different underlying representations can lead to very different rules. We're going to use an example from Russian. So we're going to look at Russian nominative nouns and genitive nouns. So nominatives are, for example, the subject of a sentence. These are the words karandash, golas, urok, tsvet, les, and soup. Pencil voice lesson color for soup. The genitive form is the one that is the equivalent of apostrophe s in English. It's like the something of the pencil, of the voice. For example, in Tsviet Karandasha, this means the color of the pencil. So it's something of the pencil, of the forest, of the soup. The data seems very clear. Uh, there seems to be just one tiny difference between the nominative and the genitive forms. So why don't you give it a try? What is the morpheme for the genitive in Russian? And what are the roots for words 1 through 6? Please pause the video. seems easy. The genitive is probably just this little a at the end of things. And the root looks like it's the nominative form. It's just uh, to form the genitive, we have the root, which is the nominative, and then we stick an a uh, as a suffix of the nominative. So it seems like we just get the root from the nominative. Let's get, uh, let's look at some more data. Let's say we add this, the word, words, for example, like Mush, Grip, Glass, Vrak, Klep, and Zavot. Husband Mushroom I, Enemy Bread Factory. Can you give it a try. What are the roots for words 7 through 12? Please pause the video. These are a little bit more tricky because there seems to be an alternation of the root. We sometimes see it, for example, in number 11 as Klep with a P. And sometimes the root appears with a B, as in chlieba, of the bread. So which one is it? Uh, this alternation can be seen throughout these examples. For example, in number eight, we have grip versus griba for mushroom. We also have an alternation where the nominative has P and the genitive has a B. So which of these two should we choose as the underlying representation of the root? It could be either. So we could have two different hypotheses. Maybe the root comes from the nominative. If it comes from the nominative, then our rule would need to say the following, that a voiceless consonant becomes voiced whenever it is followed by the sound a. Ah. So if the root came from the nominative, this p would become a b because it is followed by the genitive a. Ah. That's one way to explain the data. A second way to explain the data would be that the root comes from the genitive, that the root is actually chlieb, and that the voiced B is transformed into a voiceless P whenever it is followed by the edge of a word. So the actual root would be chlieb with a B, but 
if it's uh, if it occurs on its own as a free root then the b would come in contact with the edge of a word and then this b would be transformed into a voiceless p given as the nominative clip so it could be either of these uh, how are we going to decide we decide by looking at all of the data and seeing if the rule works for all of our uh, data points. It turns out it doesn't. It cannot be hypothesis number one because it gives us wrong predictions for the data we already had. Um, again, number one would be taking the root from the nominative and then taking the voiceless P and turning it into a voiced B whenever it's in contact with an A, as in Chlieb, uh, becoming the B in Chlieba. But if that rule was true, then it would also have to apply to these words, which also have voiceless consonants. For example, we have karandash for pencil. This esh is voiceless. So when we had the, that voiceless sound come in contact with the A of the genitive, this rule, number one, would be engaged. And so the esh would have to become the voiced ja in the incorrectly predicted karandaja. So the um, asterisk means that this form is wrong. So rule number one incorrectly predicts that the genitive of karandash would be karandaja, which is not what we observe. This happens for every single form. In number two, golas, it would incorrectly predict that the S would turn into a Z, golaza, which is incorrect. And most damning of all, number six does have a P, just like number 11. However, this P does not become a B. We, it, the form is not suba, it's supa. So it cannot be number one because this is incorrectly predicting all of these cases. It must be number two, the one where the root came from the genitive and the B was devoiced to turn it into a P whenever it was at the edge of the word. This rule would correctly predict that if the underlying representation of the root for bread is chlieb, then it would surface as chlieb when it's a free root in contact with the edge of a word, and it would remain a B, chlieba, in the genitive, quite simply because the rule does no, no longer applies. This, apply, uh, this rule applies to um, plus voiced and becoming voiceless in the contact of the edge of the word. However, this is not the edge of a word. This is a vowel. So this word no longer has the environment to trigger this rule. Moreover, if we choose the genitive form as the root, soup would work because then the root would be sup and because the p is voiceless rule of the rule of hypothesis number two is never engaged we never have the environment where we have a voiced consonant next to the a so supa just remains soup and supa this rule explains every data point in our set so it has to be the right one this pattern, by the way, is called devoicing, and it is very common in many languages. German has the exact same rule. There's words in German where the root ends in a voiced consonant, like tag, kind, and build. However, these consonants become voiceless when the root is free and in contact with the edge of a word, as in tag, kind, and bild. The voiced consonant is preserved if the root has an additional vowel, for example, from the plural, as in tage, kinder, bilder. It, uh, and like German, if the root ends in a voiceless consonant, then the rule cannot apply because it's only about voiced consonants. So a root like roots like tisch and monat remain tisch, tische, monat, monate. This pattern is called devoicing, and it is a very common phonological rule throughout the world. And the main point of this video is that, first of all, you need to be careful when you propose a rule and you need to, to figure out how it's affecting all of your data. And 
you need to be careful when you choose your underlying forms because they will influence how you write your rule and what kind of outputs you are getting.